there we go. Oh God. Good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. And uh, this evening we have a very special guest, Adnan Rashid, um, who most of you will know um, as a historian, um, a Muslim historian and a lecturer. Um, and uh, well, good evening to you, and you are most welcome, Adnan, to Blogging Theology. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. My pleasure. Excellent. Um, and um, one of the things we want we'll have to talk about uh, this evening is what happened after uh, the death of the prophet himself. And uh, with particularly, uh, why did the Muslim army under the caliphs uh, after him expand uh, at such a rapid rate, both north and northeast and, and west? Uh, what happened and what was the impetus or the, the, uh, the motive behind that, do you think? Okay, uh, very good question. If I put my historian's hat on, then there are many, many causes I can give. And if I put on my Muslim hat, um, you know, then then the answer may be slightly different. So let's let's begin with uh, my Muslim perspective. Yeah. My Muslim perspective as a believer who has studied history uh, is that uh, the companions of the Prophet did what they did after his death. Uh, you know, was due to the Quran. The Quran had stipulated um, that expansion in many different verses. Right. That expansion was simply looking at the Muslim perspective to make this world a better place. Okay. First, firstly, we are told in chapter 21, verse 107 of the Quran, that the Prophet was sent as a mercy for the worlds. Right. Okay. So, this notion was quite widely understood. It was basically this mercy was to be applied to families, to environment, to geopolitics, to geography. Basically, this was a comprehensive mercy which was promised in the Quran by God, by Allah. So the companions understood this concept of mercy that is to be delivered uh, in, in a very wide sense. Mm. So they had to do something about it. They had to go out and bring this mercy to humanity. And the only way they could do that was to remove the Byzantines and the Persians, immediate neighbors, um, uh, you know, um, to, the, to, the, to the Arabs. They had to remove them in order to bring this mercy to the people. So this was the Muslim perspective. We can go into details if you want. So the other reason in the Quran is basically to liberate the oppressed. Uh, there is a verse in chapter 4 of the Quran whereby God commanded the believers, the Muslims, to intervene where necessary. If there are people oppressed and they are calling upon you to come and liberate them from oppression, uh, you can call it oppression enduring freedom or or or, or liberation. There from certain people, yes, in America. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So this was oppression enduring freedom on the part of the Sahaba the companions of the Prophet. So they went out simply to liberate uh, the masses of the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire uh, from the oppression they were living under. Uh, so this was their perspective. In other words, to put it in simple terms, this was basically to make the world a better place through Islam, through Islam, because the Muslim view was that Islam is the only way that can bring peace and justice uh, to the world. Um, which is much needed, uh, and it was needed. If we look at the history of the time, I have written about it. Uh, there was a lot of suffering. There was a lot of uh, devastation due to wars between the Persians and the Byzantines and all that. So there was a lot of suffering and oppression and heavy taxation and persecution, religious persecution in particular. When we look at the Syrian case, uh, the Syrian masses were governed by the Byzantines who happened to be Chalcedonians right. in the... Uh, Per, you know, persuasion, uh, religiously speaking. So they were actually persecuting the masses. And this was one of the reasons why the Syrian Christians who were Orthodox Christians sided with the Arabs, the Muslims, early Muslims, when they came into Syria, taking all that land. So this was one of the reasons why uh, the expansion was so rapid and successful. So now if I put, put on my historian's hat, uh, historians have looked into the causes they 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 usually look at socio-economic causes behind the great arab expansion or uh, the great arab conquests 
mm. early Islamic conquests, they are called different things by different historians. Okay, mm. this phenomenon, phenomenon. So they look at socioeconomic causes. Uh, the Arabs came out because they were poor, they, they were struggling economically, and the Persians and the Byzantines had much wealth. They were already exhausted by wars, and the Arabs saw the opportunity and they came out and they did it. Having said that, many historians are still not clear as to how the Arabs were simultaneously able to defeat two uh, of the greatest empires uh, around at the time. And why was their expansion so successful? Why was it not stopped or checked by either one of these uh, empires? This question um, confuses or actually you know, intrigues a lot of historians to this day, they have, um, you know, they have still not decided at to, as to what caused the rapid expansion. The expansion did take place. They do try to explain it uh, using a number of different methods and causes, but they still don't know or they're not sure as to why it was so rapid. For example, Carol Hillenbrand is a historian. She has said much ink has been spilt on this phenomenon, but hardly any firm conclusions have been drawn uh, as to why this uh, expansion was so rapid and so successful, even though the Arabs were not uh, equipped with any special weapons against these empires. Yeah. Similar things have been said by Lawrence I. Conrad, a historian of early Islam, and Andrew Louth, who has also written on early Islam. So many historians have expressed their astonishment as to the speed of this expansion. So from a, a, um, a, a secular Western uh, historian's point of view, uh, ignoring the, the, the spiritual, the providential uh, the nature of what's happened, they're looking for material causes. You have these two colossal superpowers that are striding you know, the, the world and you have the Byzantines who are the, the Christians basically uh, in the, what was now be the East or the Middle East. And then you have the Persian Empire, the Sassanians who are, well, these are Astri so Astrians, I think, weren't they? Or, Correct, correct. Yes, the Russians, yes. Uh, and, and these superpowers, of course, had been uh, at war for some time, so they were weakened to some extent. But nevertheless, the, the Muslim army is like a, I don't know, like a hot, a hot knife through butter, shrimp, went straight in. And, um, and, and with it, you touched on this briefly, this extraordinary point that there were many Christians under, say, the Byzantine rule um, who were heretics. Uh, who were not, uh, you know, of the right Chalcedonian views about the nature of Jesus. It's all to do with, you know, the person of Jesus. Was he, was he one nature? Were they monophysites, or was he two natures in one person? The Chalcedonian thing. Was he God? And uh, this is a really arcane, obscure theological debate. But nevertheless, whole peoples were persecuted over this, and so the Muslim armies went in. And how did they treat? Uh, the Christians and the Jews as well. I want to touch on the Jews residing in those lands because we have a view in the West and it's almost common sense that of course the Muslims went in uh, and they spread Islam with the sword and they forced the Christians and the Jews to convert to Islam. Uh, and, and that's how, well, look at the Middle East today, look at Egypt, look at uh, Syria, look at Jordan, these are Muslim countries. Everyone was forced to convert. But actually you, there's a different story. The true story is quite different, isn't it, Adnan? Absolutely. There are many historians who have actually expressed their opinions on the notion of Muslims advancing with the sword in one hand and the Quran in the other. They have unanimously, almost unanimously, uh, rejected this notion and they look at things in a more nuanced way. Um, they don't believe that the Muslims are sweeping through these lands, uh, converting people forcefully. So that has been rejected. This was a notion, this was an idea which was widely disseminated throughout the 19th century, even before that. I mean, the Arabs with the sword and the Quran, this was a widely accepted idea up to the 19th century. It was in the 19th century when some Orientalists and historians started to question it. And then later on in the 20th century, many historians uh, completely rejected the idea. Uh, for example, A.S. Triton, uh, was one of the people who actually questioned this idea. Uh, and then later on, scholars like uh, Hugh Kennedy, who happens to be one of my supervisors uh, oh, at SOAS. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he has written a book titled The, the Great Arab Conquest. Um, 
he he also rejected this idea that the Arabs advancing with with the sword in one hand and the Quran in the other. This is uh, a, a huge lie, which which was repeated um, throughout the 19th century and was rejected, thankfully, in the 20th century. And, and uh, also Michael Bonner is another scholar who has uh, questioned this notion quite um, rightly. So this out of the way. Um, and, and, and can I just clarify? Sorry, just interrupt you there. I think that the, the reason why people may have thought that, understandably, actually, without because when Christians, uh, Christian um, missionaries and Christian armies and governments went uh, to various parts of the world, South America, North America, uh, Africa, of course, they did forcibly convert millions of people. And, and of course, Islam is just like Christianity, isn't it? You know, religions convert, force people by the sword to convert. So maybe the idea was, well, the Muslims' armies went out, so therefore they must have done what the Christians had done for centuries in forcing everyone to convert. But of course, the reality is very different, actually, because is it not built into the almost like the DNA of the Quran, of Islam, that the people of the book, the Christians and the Jews, and by extension, other groups, actually have a right under in the Sharia to practice their faith uh, uh, and to self-govern to an extent uh, as a matter of principle. So it's not just Muslims being generous, they are required by divine ordinance to treat people that way. In contradistinction to the historic Christian uh, view, as I say how the Christians treated Muslims when they uh, in, in Iberian Peninsula and the Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity. So maybe that's why people just assume where we do it like that. The Muslims must have done it like that, perhaps. Absolutely, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. You're spot on, uh, Paul, on that. And and what may surprise you, Paul, uh, is the fact that this notion of Arabian barbarity wasn't something that was invented in the 19th century. It is quite ancient. It is actually pre-Islamic. If you pick up some of the histories written by uh, some of the church fathers, uh, people like uh, Eusebius, and uh, to give you one uh, particular example, um, Socrates, uh, not Socrates, uh, the philosopher, I'm talking about Socrates, who was a fourth century uh, Christian historian, he talked about the Saracens. The word Saracen is ancient. It was used by the early church fathers, and they viewed the Ishmaelites or the Arabs as a bunch of barbarians who are uh, uh, um, semi-civilized, in, in some cases, not civilized at all. And they were always invading other territories and there were a bunch of robbers. So this is the impression that was put out to the Christian masses from the fourth century onwards, um, if not earlier. Then this particular impression or conception of the Arabs continued to be disseminated throughout Europe uh, because the Europeans who happened to be Catholic in the early ages, in the early period, when uh, Christianity did spread throughout Europe, uh, they were studying these uh, same works, the Christians in Europe were studying these same works and these perceptions, you know, they continued uh, without being challenged. And then during the Crusades, of course, the, uh, the, the Catholic monks who were writing repeatedly uh, distorted history of Islam altogether and uh, to inspire the masses to or even the barons and the, the leaders in Europe at the time to inspire them to fight the Muslims mm. for almost two centuries, if not more, they continue to paint the Muslims as a bunch of barbarians, violent people, convert people to their religion forcefully. And unfortunately, this idea or this way of uh, seeing the Arabs and the Muslims uh, continued as late as the 19th century. It was then when this notion was challenged and, of course, um, widely accepted in the 20th century and completely rejected by the 21st century, thankfully, thank God. So, so this, you see, things don't come out of vacuum. Ideas don't just appear, you know, they don't get acceptability in societies just because uh, someone said something and people believe it. They have to be repeated. They have to be repeated. And this idea of uh, Arab barbarity or forcefully converting people to their religion or Islam uh, was repeated throughout centuries. I mean, if, of course, it, it reached its peak during the Crusades period when Pope Urban II, uh, you know, the, the speech that is attributed to him delivered in France, uh, if the speech did take place, then uh, even the Pope 
said uh, things like that, that the Christians are being forcefully converted, they are being killed, they are being tortured, and the tomb of Christ is being desecrated. Therefore, we have to go and liberate the Holy Land. So this rhetoric and this narrative was widely spread, widely believed. Therefore, um, uh, all the violence that was uh, unleashed against the Muslim world was justified through views like this. Uh, so, of course, um, the, the reality is quite uh, the opposite, mm. because when we study the history of Islam, of course, there were periods of disturbances. There were, there were periods where um, Islamic law was not followed. And these are exceptional periods throughout the Muslim history. For example, I can give you the example of al mohads in the 12th century when they took Spain from the Muravids, al muravids or al muravitun uh, they forced uh, some people to accept Islam. Maimonides, the famous Jewish theologian, was one of them. And actually, you know, when you look at Maimonides' history, you come to realize he not only forced fully accepted Islam, uh, he, he was forced into it. Uh, later on, he, 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 he renounced Islam in Egypt when he had moved to Egypt and then he was put on trial for apostasy. And then the Christ, uh, Muslim the theologians, Muslim theologians came forward to rescue him and to defend him. Uh, they had argued in the court that Maimonides was forced into Islam. Therefore, his conversion was not valid. And if the conversion was not valid, his apostasy is not valid. He was never a Muslim. He was forced into Islam. So Maimonides was rescued by Muslims in Egypt. And he became the physician. There is, there is the chronic verse, there is no compulsion in religion. So if that is violated. Obviously, it, it, it's invalid, invalid, that conversion. But what about yeah. the... the uh, sorry, come on. The, these examples are very, very uh, limited. Uh, there was a period of persecution in the 10th century when mad caliph al-Hakim, who was a Fatimid caliph, he had uh, done similar things. So these are very, very, uh, how can I put it, um, you know, limited incidents in Islamic history. But if you look at the wider picture from Al-Andalus, from Spain to China, where Muslims governed for a very, very long time, uh, forced conversion uh, is not found. It doesn't represent the history of Islam or Muslims. In fact, as you rightly pointed out, that there is a verse in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 256, that clearly states that uh, con converting people forcefully is absolutely, utterly forbidden. La ikraha fid din. There is no compulsion in religion hmm. because truth, uh, truth stands clear from falsehood. Let people decide themselves. Let them see the Quran and uh, let, let them see Islam and if they want to convert let them convert if they don't want to convert don't ever force them this was the the behavior throughout the Muslim history uh, I've heard some people say oh well this is this verse is just a, a very early Meccan verse when uh, you know Muhammad was powerless and of course he'd say to people you know we're not going to force you but when he became um, you know the ruler of Medina the the, uh, the caliph or whatever word um, th at that point yeah things changed but of course the facts are very different because that when was that verse revealed? Was it not in Medina, precisely after uh, he had escaped to that city and was the ruler there? Then that verse was revealed, not in the early, but in the later era. Is that not the case? Correct. Uh, if you look at the tafsir, the details, or the reasons for revelation uh, for this particular verse, mm -hmm. you come to realize that this verse was revealed about the Jewish people of Medina. Uh, some some Arabs had left their children with the Jewish people for them to be educated, and these children had uh, accepted Judaism because they were inspired or, in, or influenced by the Jewish people of Medina. So these Arabs, when they accepted Islam, the Arabs of Medina, after the Prophet had arrived in Medina, they approached the Prophet asking him, shall we convert our children forcefully? And the Prophet uh, didn't give an answer straight away. This verse was revealed uh, soon after as a response to their question. Right. And the verse is very categorical that leaves them, leave them. If they convert to Islam willingly, then it is accepted. But you cannot force people to convert to Islam. So this is the context. This is the reason for revelation for this particular verse. So those people who argue that it is a Meccan idea when Muslims were weak and when Muslims became powerful, their attitude changed. Uh, no, attitude did not change. Rather, if you look at the uh, later history of the Muslims, you will see that Muslims 
signed treaties with Christians they had already conquered. Uh, in some cases, the Jewish people as well. Muslims had already conquered lands and then treaties were signed. And these treaties basically offered freedom to Christians, freedom to worship, freedom to keep their places of worship, freedom to keep their bishops, freedom to keep their religion and, and their property. Uh, nothing so, will change. So, yeah. so Christians under Muslim rule can eat pork, they can drink alcohol, and they can have their customs and their religion under Muslim rule. Not, that, not only that, not only that, not only that, uh, the Muslims have to protect pig farms. If Christians are farming pigs uh, and someone is disturbing them or someone's uh, threatening Christians for doing so, Muslim state has a responsibility by the law of Islam to protect pig farms. They would send Muslims, to, I mean, ideally, I'm talking about ide uh, an idealistic uh, state if, ever, if it ever exists. Um, Muslim state would have to, and if Christians are producing wine for themselves, uh, not for selling to Muslims, no. uh, then even that wine factory, if they are producing, because they're paying jizya, they're paying a tax for their protection, for their well-being, and the, it's state's responsibility to protect their interests, to protect their religion, to pr protect their places of worship, and protect their honor and their property. So uh, by that is, virtue... Yeah, but, so this is a very good, good point, uh, going into the question of what is jizya and how that relates to zakat, whatever that may be. And, and because uh, in the West, of course, jizya is seen as a, uh, I don't know, an unjust is imposition of some terrible financial penalty for simply being Christian. If I had this conversation an hour ago with a, a young guy, I would say who he is, but he's a in a French school uh, here, and uh, that's what he understood jizya was. Actually, it was a punishment uh, for uh, Christians and Jews, uh, a financial penalty. That's what he said. Uh, um, now, this guy has been taught in French schools as we speak, and he's got that idea in his head. Anyway, that's a different subject. But what, what is the truth about jizya? What, what's the real deal about it? Jizya, jizya is a tax which the non-Muslims pay living within the domain of Islam. And Muslims also pay a tax, but it is not called jizya. It is called zakat, which mm. is compulsory tax for the Muslims. Muslims must pay 2.5% of the savings to the state uh, for the state to distribute that money among the poor. With regards to jizya, jizya is a fixed amount. Uh, it, it varies between one gold coin weighing four grams of gold to four gold coins. So a gold coin, uh, looking at the Islamic history, uh, would be called dinar. A dinar was about four grams of gold which is in current value, it would be something like uh, maybe 200 pounds, something like 200 pounds in current value. So uh, a rich Jew or Christian or a Zoroastrian would pay uh, about uh, 200 pounds a year towards the state for uh, basically, um, as a citizen, he would contribute that towards the state as a citizen. And in return, the state takes full responsibility for protecting his rights, for protecting his life, his family, as we had, uh, we have, we have already highlighted. So uh, the, the 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 amount varies between one to four dinars. It cannot exceed that, Islamically speaking. Although some rulers may have exceeded the amount, and this um, this uh, um, this extra amount cannot be Islamic. It cannot be regarded Islamic, uh, even by the scholars of Islam. So. Uh, there is a limited amount. So the, the middle class Jews and Christians, they would pay something like 24 silver coins. Um, and people who are doing hard labor, they would be paying 12 silver coins a year, which is like uh, 12 pounds, equivalent to 12 pounds a year, right? Uh, so those people who claim that jizya was extortionate, jizya was astronomical, jizya broke backs of the uh, uh, non-Muslims, these are all, again, uh, you know, misconceptions spread throughout centuries, and they still survive, unfortunately. But if anyone wants to study jizya carefully, idealistically speaking, Islamically speaking, jizya cannot exceed uh, more than four gold coins per year for rich, for the rich. And that's where it is capped. It can, while Muslims, if there is a Muslim, for example,
or who has a million pounds in his bank account, he would pay 25,000 pounds on that because that's 2.5%. But if a Jewish man has a million pounds in his bank account, he would be paying four gold coins, which is like 800 pounds a year. That's mm -hmm. it. No one, no one, Islamically, legally speaking, can ask him to pay extra. And the Jewish man can go to the Muslim court and complain if he's, uh, if he's asked to give uh, extra. And this has happened, Islamically speaking, in history. In fact, um, there is a famous case when uh, people went to complain to scholars uh, because of heavy taxation on the part of the Muslim rulers. This happened in Syria during the Mongol invasions when uh, Sultan uh, Baybars had imposed heavy taxation on the Muslims and the non-Muslims to defend against the Mong Mongols. Although he had valid reasons to raise taxation, uh, Iz bin Abdul Salam um, was a scholar alive in Egypt at the time. He gave a fatwa to undo the, the, the decree of the ruler. So the rulers must abide by the, ru uh, the, the, the law of Islam. And if they are breaking the law, using power and influence, then they are doing wrong. Ideally, uh, Islamic law doesn't allow uh, more than uh, what is stipulated in the law. Okay. Uh, to the last uh, discussion, if we may, is the Islamic conquest of what some people call the Iberian Peninsula, which is a, just a fancy way of talking about today, is Spain and Portugal. Um, and um, I mean, I I've heard, I don't know if it's true or not, that um, the, the invasion itself, the, the, the general who actually led the invasion, was not authorized to do so by the caliph in, I don't know if he's in Baghdad or Mecca, I can't, can't remember. But nevertheless, he went in. Some people say that the Jews uh, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula um, helped the Muslims uh, to enter into that land for their own reasons. Um, but nevertheless, the civilization that grew out of that uh, invasion uh, in the coming centuries, uh, uh, an Islamic civilization with Jews and Christians was one of the jewels of human history in terms of its culture, um, its literature, its philosophy, its, uh, uh, in many ways. And it lasted many, many centuries until it was uh, crushed by uh, the Catholics who then did various terrible things to the Jews and the Muslims. But coming back to that initial point, is it true that the initial invasion was not authorized by the Caliph? You see, um, generals, um, at that time, when early Islamic conquests were still taking place during the Umayyad period, generals had, um, they were semi-autonomous. Mm -hmm. They had certain discretions uh, for them to decide, for example, if they, if they wanted to invade a territory which uh, appeared to be open to, uh, open to Muslims, or if the people were inviting the Muslims to come in and liberate them, like what happened, in the case of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, um, then generals could do it without asking for permission. Right. But any major, any, any major campaign, of course, any major campaign had to be sanctioned by the Caliph. But in this case, what seems to have happened is that the Jewish people of Spain were heavily oppressed and uh, Jewish historians have testified to that. For example, one particular historian, Zion Zohar, who wrote a book titled History of Sephardic and Mitzrayi Jewry. Uh, Sephardic Jews were uh, Spanish Jews predominantly. Of course, uh, they also lived in other parts of the Middle East and North Africa. But when we say Sephardic Jews, we are talking specifically of mainly Spanish Jewry. And Portuguese, so, and Portuguese as well. Perhaps. Portuguese, as well, of course. When we say Spanish, we mean we mean, of course. This this is why scholars use the term Iberian Peninsula to include Portugal and possibly parts of southern France uh, yeah. and 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 Spain, current day Spain, yeah. right? So uh, the Jewish people were heavily oppressed. In fact, uh, there was a council that took place in the year six thirty three CE in the city of Toledo. Uh, Spain by now, or the Iberian Peninsula by now, was Catholic, while previously it was uh, Arian or uh, Donatist. Uh, the Vandals and the Goths did not actually follow Catholicism. They were Unitarians in some form. And then later on, uh, some kings converted uh, to Catholicism. Uh, Visigothic kings converted to, later Visigothic kings rather, they converted to Catholicism and Catholic Church took control of 
the Iberian Peninsula. And then many uh, ecumenical councils were held. And in these councils, matters were discussed, important matters for uh, the state and the church. So in 633, Fourth Council of Toledo was held. In this council, it was decreed that all the children of the Iberian Jews, Spanish Jews or Portuguese Jews, all the children are to be taken away by force and they are to be converted to Catholicism and are to be raised as pious Christians by um, institutions in Spain or the Iberian Peninsula. So this is a year after the prophet died. Prophet died in 632 CE. This council was held in 633 CE. What does this show you? This shows you that the Jewish people were heavily persecuted within the Iberian Peninsula. So when Tariq bin Ziyad uh, with his 5,000 Arabs and 7,000 Berbers from North Africa yeah. landed um, at Gibraltar and later on um, mainland Iberian Peninsula or Spain, uh, he was welcomed by the Jewish people. This is confirmed by Zion Zohar and many other Jewish historians uh, that the Jews welcomed the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. And this was one of the reasons why the Muslims were able to take so much land in such a short span of time. Within four years, the entire I Iberian Peninsula, except uh, some northwestern part of the peninsula no. called Astorians, uh, where a movement, Reconquista, historically speaking, started, right? So northwestern part, slight, you know, some, some patches of the Iberian Peninsula were not conquered uh, due to the terrain. The terrain was very difficult, but the rest of it was taken almost in within four years. And uh, why, why, why were they able to do it so rapidly, the Muslims? Because the people supported uh, the invasion. Mm -hmm. And when some Spanish, uh, later Spanish writers claimed that the conquest was devastating, cities were burned to the ground, and cities were pillaged, people were killed and murdered. Uh, a lot of these chronicles, in, fa in fact, there's an, there is an, an anonymous chronicle written in 754, almost 40 years after the conquest. Uh, this Christian author, anonymous Christian author, claimed all these things. But then later on in the 20th century and the 21st century, all modern works point to the opposite direction. Uh, they claim that archeology span tells us another story. When we look at the Muslim period, the cities started to flourish. They became bigger and bigger, larger and larger. The economic condition we see in archeology span improved drastically from looking at what was happening during the Visigothic period, uh, just the, the, the period just before Islam, right? So um, many, many scholars have challenged using archeology, span the notion of uh, a devastating invasion of Spain. Of course, uh, when there is war, you could say, you could say that uh, in a, in a very real way that Islam saved Jewry there in that part of the world. That if Islam, if the Muslim army hadn't gone in, then uh, the Jews, uh, the, as practicing Jews, the faith of Judaism might have been obliterated in a kind of Christian Holocaust in a way by taking the children away, forcing them to be educated by I don't know by monks or nuns or priests, indoctrinated into uh, the, the Catholic faith. And so you talk about an invasion, but it reminds me of kind of the, the neocon language, you know, Operation Freedom, which you mentioned at the beginning, you know, in invading Iraq, which really was an invasion. But from another point of view, it would have been seen as a liberation for the Jews and others. It would have been a, a liberation. Uh, and the subsequent history of that country is extraordinary, isn't it, Adnan? The, the, the cultural renaissance predating the European renaissance, renaissance, as if that was the first renaissance, but there was a renaissance in the Iberian Peninsula centuries before of world historical significance. Can you say a bit about why that is such an important part of our world history, what happened in, in Spain and Portugal? In fact, uh, Jewish historians have repeatedly claimed that that was the golden age of the House of Israel. That was the Jewish golden age, in particular uh, from the 10th, 10th to the uh, 13th century. Um, from the 10th to the 13th century, 950s to 1250s, this was the golden age of the Jewish people in Spain, particularly. And there's a reason for that. So before I get to that, 
I just want to very quickly highlight what happened after the conquest. After the conquest, there was a period of turmoil, political turmoil, because the Umayyads were removed from power. Uh, the Abbasids came to power. Cut the long story short, the Umayyads were able to establish a caliphate in Spain. Uh, and Abdul Rahman I was the first Umayyad caliph of Spain, independent caliph, independent from the Abbasids. Thenceforth, a civilization of a grand scale was created. Books uh, were produced, uh, libraries were established, streets were paved. Basically, cut the long story short, Cordoba became the most civilized and the most populated city in the world with a population of a million people in um, the 10th century uh, when Abdurrahman III was ruling. In the 10th century, in the mid-10th mid uh, century, when uh, the Umayyads uh, were at their peak, uh, the vizier or the prime minister was a Jewish man called Hazdai ibn Shaprut. This is why Jewish people regard that period as the golden age. This is the period during the Muslim period, at least the peak of the Umayyad Empire, uh, Jewish people produce some of the best scholars, the best poets, the best thinkers, philosophers, you name it. The, the best Jewish literature ever produced was produced in Islamic Spain, in Al-Andalus, or in the Islamic Iberian Peninsula, when the Muslims are ruling. Muslims ruled part of Spain, parts of Spain from uh, 711 to 1492. Wow. Um, and yeah, almost 700 years. And um, uh, as for, for at least 300 years, Muslims dominated the political and military landscape of the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, during this period, we had immense libraries created at great expense by caliphs, by book collectors, by scholars in Spain. Spain was, you can say, uh, if you were to walk into Cambridge uh, University or Bodleian Library and you see how pe people are busy reading books and producing researches, Spain was like that mm -hmm. under the Muslim period. You know, uh, there is no other comparison I can draw. I mean, Baghdad was like that as well, of course, at that time. Uh, one of the largest libraries in the world was in Baghdad, uh, which was destroyed regretfully by the Mongols in 1258 uh, when the entire library of Baghdad of course, with the city of Baghdad was completely burnt down or uh, thrown into the river. Can so, I know when, sorry, when the, the reconquest of the, the so called reconquest of the Catholic armies, the Christian armies, uh, uh, perhaps due to disunity and division within the, uh, um, the, the, the Islamic uh, state, uh, w w when the, they, that completed, was it Isabella and Fernand, uh, I forget the name, Ferdinand, the, the king and the queen uh, at that time, who were uh, revered, I think, possibly as saints in the Catholic Church. W w when they reconquered, did they continue this tradition of um, uh, working with Jews and uh, Muslims in a in this high civilizational mode? Uh, how did they, or, or did they uh, destroy that? What, what what did they do to this one Re civilization? The Reconquista, Reconquista started in the 11th century. Uh, you can say by the mid 11th century, Reconquista had already started and it took another, let's say, four to 450 years for the Christians to take the rest of the Iberian Peninsula from Muslims. It wasn't uh, yeah. sudden, it wasn't uh, absolute. It took a while for the Catholics to take back the land from the Muslims. So initially, um, Cities like Toledo, where Muslims had created a large, giant library. In fact, there were many libraries in the city of Toledo. Uh, the city of Babastro was taken in 1066. city of Toledo was taken in 1085. And then later on, uh, fast forward in the 13th century, uh, many more cities were taken. Uh, there was a battle in 1204 between the Almohads and uh, Spanish kings, a coalition of Spanish kings uh, who came from the north, uh, that battle was lost. And as a result, uh, many, many cities like Seville, Valencia, and Cordoba eventually, uh, all three cities were lo lost within the 13th century. And what remained was the Nasserid dynasty in southern Spain called Granada or Granata in the Arabic language. That remained, and then it, it, that dynasty survived for another 250 years. Initially, uh, kings that came from the north, 
taking all that territory. They were completely blown away by the civilization of Islam and Muslims in cities like Valencia, Seville, and Cordoba. They were completely blown away and they were uh, completely immersed within that civilization. And they, in fact, copied a lot of ideals and ideas at that time. They, they, they maintained tolerance in, uh, initially. Uh, they followed the Muslim model. They had realized that one of the reasons why Islamic civilization in Spain was so successful was because of the coexistence Muslims had mastered. And that period is referred to by Spanish Arabists as la convivencia or the convivencia. Uh, convivencia means coexistence, uh, if we were to translate it into English. So that period is known as the period of co coexistence and the Christian monarchs initially followed that tradition. In fact, many of them adopted Muslim culture. Uh, they started to bathe, they started to dress like Muslims, they started to inscribe Arabic uh, formulas uh, um, inside their palaces. They started to use the decoration of the Muslims uh, in the palace. They, were, they became completely Arabized, culturally speaking, yep. not religiously, culturally speaking. Yep. But later on, unfortunately, uh, things started to change and many Jewish people and Muslim people faced heavy persecution. Uh, and by the 15th century and the 16th century, um, things had changed completely. It was in the 15th century, 1492, to be precise, a coalition of two states, Aragon and Castile, um, they invaded the last stronghold of Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula, and they took uh, the state or the city of Granada after a long siege and the library of Granada, over a million books were burnt. They were destroyed. We don't know, only Allah knows what we lost there. Uh, much of the Spanish legacy when it comes to lit literature and other uh, educational contributions was lost in that particular destruction. And um, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, were the monarchs who did this. And then uh, after the, taking um, the city of Cordoba, sorry, not Cordoba, Granada, uh, Christopher Columbus departed for uh, yeah. looking, you know, he, he, he departed. I mean, he was funded by Ferdinand and Isabella. Not many people know this. He was actually funded by Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, and this was a state venture. And Christopher Columbus bumped into America thinking it was India. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's another story. And story. in fact, that story is directly linked to the, the decline of Islam in the Iberian Peninsula, yes. right? It, it is directly linked. And in fact, it is, it is believed that uh, Christopher Columbus had uh, Arabic cartographers and navigators helping him out, sure. you know? Yes. Yeah, so th th this is claimed. I don't know how true that is. I have read about it somewhere. It, it, it would seem so, true. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so after Ferdinand and Isabella took Granada, they forcefully converted the Muslims and the Jewish people. Muslims became uh, Moriscos yeah. and the Jewish people became Converses, right? These are the titles or these are the names given to them. And um, um, I invite everyone, every viewer to read on Moriscos uh, and you will be blown away by the, the, the amount of oppression. Savagery. And, right? yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 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 Prove themselves yeah. by uh, eating pork and Muslims had to prove themselves by drinking wine. I mean, it was appalling. It was difficult to exaggerate how appalling the persecution was in the name of Christianity, of course. Um, yeah, yeah and, and, and you see, um, the Iberian Peninsula lost what it had created for the last 700 years, and this was a huge loss to that particular land or piece of land. Um, you know, and uh, later on, what came with the Catholic monarchs, Muslims survived for another century, until uh, Philip III came to power in 1609, he banished all the Muslims. He had uh, expelled all the Muslims, all remaining Muslims, albeit converted, forcefully converted Muslims called Moriscos um, to North Africa. Many of them died en route. Many of them remained behind. Uh, many of them were sent to the Americas and some found their way to North America, and some of those families can still be found in places like Morocco and Algeria. And the Jewish people, that's, that's a completely another story. I mean, they were completely decimated. Many Jewish people were killed off. 
uh, while they were on their way to the coast and others were forcefully converted again and very few made it to uh, Ottoman lands, cities like Salonika, Jerusalem and, uh, and uh, uh, Constantinople. So there were neighborhoods as late as the 19th century uh, in cities like Constantinople, Salonika and Jerusalem, uh, neighborhoods belonging to Jewish uh, people who came from Spain, Spanish yeah. Jewry. Yeah. And they were known to be very civilized, very educated, very upright, uh, very much prosperous. Uh, they had their own um, quarters, they had their own privileges, and they were seen to be very, very important people throughout the Ottoman period until and the state of Israel was created. Yeah. yeah, indeed, that changed the world as well. But um, coming back to the Spanish Inquisition, I, I, I've read part of its uh, motivation uh, and part of its, uh, you know, objective was to sniff out these um, these Jews, uh, particularly uh, and Muslims too, who professed to be Catholic, who were forced to be Catholic, but who secretly held on to the belief in the oneness of God, for example, uh, a key belief of Jews. Uh, the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We find that taught in the Quran as well, of course. And this is offensive to uh, to Christians, to Catholics who believe that God is three. And uh, and so the Inquisition uh, sought to find these people and, and to root them out. And to, obviously, if they were discovered, they could be burnt at the stake uh, horribly. Um, so the persecution, it, it wasn't just formally. You really had to, they, they didn't want anyone who even pretended to be uh, uh, Catholic, that you had to be a real Catholic, and if you were a secret Jew, you, that was not acceptable. Even then, it was there was no tolerance, uh, as we understand it, Islamically or in the modern sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the the Spanish Inquisition was one of the most, uh, how can I put it, unpleasant episode in human history, whereby hundreds of thousands of people were brutalized, tortured in dungeons, forcefully converted raped, cut to pieces, and burnt at stake, you name it. And uh, the history is far too um, disturbing for me to discuss in a very short sitting like this. There are books written by scholars on Inquisition. One 19th century scholar uh, produced a lot of work. Uh, his works, in, in, I mean, they haven't been entirely outdated, but there is a lot of information he collected. Henry Charles Lee. Lee is spelt with L-E-A. Henry Charles Lee has written not only a book on Moriscos, but he also wrote on the, the Spanish Inquisition extensively. And his books are very, very important. Also, if you if people want to read some modern works on Moriscos and what they went through, Morisco, Moriscos were basically converted Muslims. Muslims who were forcefully converted to Islam and they were in hundreds of thousands. People think they were a few thousand. No, they were in hundreds of thousands and they were seen as a threat. In fact, some of the Catholic advisors to kings at that time, in particular, King Philip III, who decided to banish them, uh, uh, Catholics were worried about the growing population of the Muslims in uh, the Iberian Peninsula or in Spain at that time. Uh, and some advisors thought that the Muslims will outnumber yeah. the Christians in Spain if they were not banished or stopped, right? Uh, the same fears are, that are being used today in Europe, you know, demographic fears where people are talking about increasing influence of Islam and increasing well, population. Of course, uh, uh, the, the increasing numbers of Palestinians, Arabs in uh, what is called Israel, um, is also a concern for Israelis. And just mentioning Israel there, but, but that going into all of that, but the history that you're describing are, are one of great tolerance and inclus inclusiveness of Jewish populations, culture, the practice of the Torah is respected and permitted for many, many centuries. Um, gives the lie to the idea that Islam uh, is anti-Jewish or anti-Judaism. Uh, no, you know, it allows, formally it has to, by, by, by command, it has to allow these groups to exist and flourish. And it's only with the, uh, I, I would think, and uh, the establishment of, of, of Zionist, uh, the Zionist entity called Israel in, uh, in Palestine that suddenly this whole thing became very poison, very toxic. Uh, the relations were destroyed between um, Jews and Muslims. And this was a new thing, was it not, uh, Adnan, a new thing in, in Muslim history. This wasn't like going back to, I don't know, the last medi the medieval period of Jewish-Muslim relations. This was uh, a, a, an innovation, a bidder, if you like, uh, 
in, in those relationships. And it's only almost in our lifetimes that we've seen this incredibly toxic, conflicted relationship between Jews and Christians. But it's to do with the political uh, establishment of a Zionist um, structure uh, on, on Muslim lands, uh, the land of Palestine, of course. Absolutely. Uh, you see, Muslims and Jews coexisted for almost 1,300 years. And it wouldn't be wrong to say that the Jews survived extinction due to the Muslim protection. This is not an exaggeration. Historically speaking, Jewish historians have confirmed this. Jacob Lasner is an American Jewish historian who has written a very, very good book on uh, the Jewish experience under Islam. In fact, even uh, some of the Zionist historians who are evidently hostile to Islam and things Islamic have confirmed this. People like Bernard Lewis, he wrote in his books that Muslims were treated far better than they were in Christian lands. Uh, Muslims are treated uh, under Muslims far better than they were in Christian lands. Yeah. This is this is Bernard Lewis speaking, uh, who who was seen he's as an authority in history. He's, he's Bernard Lewis was a, a Jew himself, speaking about his own people and how they were treated in centuries past, much much better than Jews were treated in the Christian world in Christendom. Absolutely, absolutely, and there are many many more Jewish historians who have paid lavish tributes to the Muslim civilization and the protection the Jewish people received in general. In fact, some scholars even claim that the majority of the Jewish population in the world for over a thousand years lived within the domains of Islam. So if Islam or the Muslim civilization had any anti-Semitic policy, it would have reflected uh, in our history. It would have, it would have, uh, it would have been evident in our history, which, which, which is not the case. What we do see is that the Jewish people flourishing throughout the Muslim civilization from Spain to China. In fact, there are periods when the Jewish people became highly successful in business, in uh, producing literature, in educating people, in, uh, in occupations like uh, uh, medicine, for example. Some of the top physicians in the Muslim world were Jewish. Some of the top authors and poets were Jewish, okay? Some of the advisors to Muslim sultans were Jewish, military advisors, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Jewish people, they flourished, they enjoyed their life under, uh, under the House of Islam. In fact, one of the Jewish scholars uh, called Amnon Cohen, Amnon Cohen has um, produced a two volume work titled A World From Within. And he studied the court records of the city of Jerusalem from the year 1500 to 1570. This was the Ottoman period when yeah. Sultan Suleiman, the Ottoman Sultan was ruling uh, this territory. During the Ottoman period, Amnon Cohen argues that the Jewish people were filing cases within the Islamic court. They were coming to the Muslim court, even though they had Beth Dins, their own rabbinic courts within the city of Jerusalem, whereby they had the autonomy to govern their own society with their own law, they were applying um, with the Islamic court to get justice. And this was happening because they would get justice quicker within the Islamic court than they would within their own courts. And in his conclusion, he states that the Jewish people had nothing to complain about uh, throughout this period. Uh, so from 1500 to 1570, what he has seen in this period is prosperity, uh, coexistence, tolerance for the Jewish people, even freedom to apply uh, um, within the Muslim courts. You know, they, they could come to the Muslim courts and apply for justice. Uh, and cases varied from uh, uh, provisions when there is a dispute between husband and wife and the husband refuses to provide for the family. The Jewish women were applying with the Muslim courts for justice and justice was given, it was, it, it was delivered. So Amnon Cohen having studied these records, he concluded that the Jewish people were very prosperous, very happy, and they, they had nothing to complain about living under the, the Ottoman Sultans. So something, uh, I'm not gonna go into the Palestinian-Israeli conflict here because it's a totally different subject, but Absolutely. clearly something catastrophic happened uh, in the history of Islam in 1,300 years to change all this so dramatically and seemingly finally. Uh, some of it happened in the 20th century, of course. Um, and we're not going to go into that. Uh, people, people know what it's about. So, but, but I just wanted to stress this because of how 
totally uncharacteristic. This uh, there, there is anti-Semitism amongst Muslims. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it at Speaker's Corner, particularly after you get a, an atrocity or an attack. And I've I've seen some stuff which you know can come out of Germany in the 30s. And I, I you know I mean as, not many people, but I have I've heard it from Muslims' lips, and it's shocking. And um, and of course, to European ears, it sounds very shocking. But historically, this has got to be put into a context. This is a very recent development triggered by appalling uh, events in the Middle East, which we all know about, we see it all the time. We must remember that. And now, unfortunately, Islam has become uh, stained in people's eyes, some people's eyes, with uh, an anti-Semitic uh, trope. And, uh, but uh, that's not just given everything you said, Adnan, about Islamic history and the Quran and everything else. So it's very, very sad, very, very sad. Um, that's all I can absolutely, say. absolutely. And, and what you need to think about is that hostility comes from both sides. Uh, there are Zionist propagandists who are claiming um, a very bad experience of the Jewish people with Islam and Muslims. And on the other hand, there are anti-Semitic Muslims who are making statements that are outrightly anti-Jewish. And both of these realities do not reflect, um, are not reflected in the history of Islam. Both of these realities, the Muslim anti-Semitism is something new. Where it does exist, it is something new. Mm -hmm. And Zionist hostility uh, or, or um, basically distortion of Muslim history is also something new. Dean Philip Bell, who is a historian of the Jewish people, also wrote in his book, I forgot the title of his book, he wrote that uh, the Jewish golden age, the notion of the Jewish golden age under Islam was never really questioned until the state of Israel was created. Oh. It was only then when the, the notion of the Jewish golden age under Islam was questioned by Zionist propagandists and historians, right? So this phenomenon, the, the, the Muslim anti-Semitism, albeit in a very minor uh, you know, segment of the Muslim community, uh, is something new. This is, this is entirely caused by the recent unfortunate, uh, un, un, uh, recent unfortunate events in Israel. Uh, and since the creation of the state of Israel, this relationship between the Jewish people and the Muslim civilization in general has become bitter. And there are many, many ill feelings, unfortunately, caused by this extremist ideology, which was forged by the Jew, uh, you know, Jewish anti-Semitism, or sorry, anti-Semitism anti against Jewish people in the 19th century. So unfortunately, for some reason, the Palestinians were punished for European anti-Semitism. This is another... Um, yeah. And there's a nasty twist now, this is going off the subject a bit, but where anti-Semitism, uh, real anti-Semitism is, in, in Britain anyway, is deliberately conflated with being pro-Palestinian and anti-Zionist. So it's becoming very difficult now to speak publicly of uh, criticising uh, the politics of the state of Israel uh, as a state, uh, without being accused of this heinous sin of anti-Semitism. So effectively, mm -hmm. there is a shutting down of freedom of speech to speak out in terms of justice for an oppressed group, uh, well, the oppressed groups on all sides, particularly the, the Palestinians. So it, it, it's getting worse. The screws are turning. Now to, e to even say these things is being labelled as anti-Semitism, which is the, a great sin in the eyes in the West. It's actually criminalised, uh, and you can be... Uh, censored, lose your job. Uh, we've seen what's happened to the Labour Party, the leader, the former leader of the Labour Party, who was ludicrously and ridiculously accused of anti-Semitism. He spent his whole life campaigning against racism, his whole life, and yet he was accused of this uh, because he was pro-Palestinian. And the, the way these two now have uh, very cleverly been fused together, uh, it's a very clever manoeuvre. But this is a, a different subject, but um, I, I just despair sometimes. Absolutely. And and there are two things people need to remember from Islam when it comes to dealing with non-Muslims in general, not only, only the Jewish people. Uh, this is a general verse in the Quran in chapter 60, verse 8, where God Almighty stated that God does not forbid you from being kind to those who do not fight you for your religion and do not drive you out of your homes. Be just, be kind to them. So this is chapter 60, verse 8, where there is a general rule when it comes to dealing with non-Muslims, those who do not fight you, do not drive you out, do not brutalize you, do not kill you, do not persecute you, you are to be kind to them. This is a general rule stipulated within the Quran. 
also when it comes to the Jewish people in particular, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he had a treaty with the Jewish people of Medina, uh, one of the clauses in the treaty, actually the conclusion of the treaty states that the Muslims are to extend a sympathetic treatment towards the Jewish people. Okay, this is clearly stipulated in the Treaty of Medina, which was uh, documented or which was uh, basically still, put down. We, we still have this treaty, don't we? It's, still, it's extant. Absolutely. We, we can, Absolutely. We can, people can, uh, I've read this. I, I know Wikipedia is a dodgy source sometimes, but I have read uh, this, uh, an article on Wikipedia on the Treaty of Medina or co the Constitution of Medina, as it's called also. And people can read this for themselves and, 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 and many other extraordinarily modern in a way um, uh, protections for religious freedom and the rights of people who are not Muslims in, in, in this in this uh, nascent state in Medina. It's quite extraordinary, I think. You see, one, one confusion can arise, uh, Paul, from reading the Quran. A lot of people see a lot of criticism of uh, the House of Israel in the Quran and some of the practices. So what they do is they, they jump straight to a, a, a wrong conclusion, claiming that the Quran is essentially or intrinsically anti-Semitic, which is not the case. Uh, the Quran criticizes Christian beliefs. Quran criticizes Jewish beliefs. Quran criticizes pagan beliefs. So the Quran is a book that was revealed to reveal the truth. Mm. And when truth is revealed, of course, falsehood in the eyes of God, as we the Muslims believe, has to be highlighted. So as far as the Muslims are concerned, the Jewish religion, the Christian religion, and uh, other uh, ideas that have been criticized in the Quran are simply false. You know, they, they are not true ways to God. And that's very, very, very categorically stated in the Quran. Now, that does not mean that you start to persecute the Christians and the Jews and other non-Muslims, because for that, rules have been stipulated again within the Quran, uh, making it very clear that you cannot compel them to accept Islam. You are to you are to treat them kindly, even though they are different, they believe in different things. You are to treat them as the people of the book, in particular, the Jewish and the Christian people. They are given the title Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book. In fact, uh, uh, you can even marry from the people of the book, right? Uh, how can you marry someone you are to hate? This is, I mean, a lot of people erroneously ask me this question. Can we, can we be friends with the Jews and the Christians? And I ask them, can you marry an enemy? Can you get married to your enemy? Is that possible? Would you marry uh, your enemy? And they say no. So how can you have a wife in your house who is a Jew or a Christian and not have a relationship with her okay not be friendly towards her not even you know okay. absolutely so 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 this is this is something people you know these are the nuances people overlook very often when they're talking about islam and judaism and christianity and uh you know exchanging of ideas between these three, three abrahamic faiths what i find interesting I, I, this is going off a subject and I, I won't pursue this subject because we're perhaps drawing to a close now but um is when I read the, the New Testament, let alone the Old Testament, that there is no sense in, in the New Testament documents who are never, were never designed to address these questions anyway of, well, how do we coexist in an ongoing society? How, how do we relate to non-Christians? So what rights do they have or responsibilities and so on? This doesn't exist in the New Testament at all. Um, now, my own view is it's because many of the authors thought the world was going to end pretty pretty short, uh, quickly. Paul certainly did uh, in various letters. He, you know, the end's coming, basically. So you're not going to be thinking in terms of how do we build a just society where people's responsibilities and rights are acknowledged. But it, Islam, uh, as sees itself as the last testament rather than the New Testament, the last one, obviously ha has thought about these uh, questions and come to an understanding about how to keep going through the generations through history in a way that the Bible doesn't do, interestingly enough. And so in the Catholic Church, they had to develop new understandings, new ideas through Augustine and Aquinas and so on to add on what was not there. But it, it, it's there in the beginning with Islam. And I think that's one of the differences between Christianity in its origins and Islam in its origins. Uh, it, it, Islam was fully matured from the beginning, whereas Christianity was very embryonic and took many, many centuries to become a, a civilization, uh, Christendom, which did have these elements in it. Uh, anyway, this is my view. You, you see, Paul, what you said is absolutely right. 
uh, there are no clear instructions on how to treat the other uh, in the New Testament. And you know what was the outcome, the result of that? The result of that was confusion for mm -hmm. 2,000 years mm -hmm. and people making things up as they went along. Uh, some societies persecuted the Jewish people, some did not. And if it wasn't for Augustine writing in uh, the fourth century, if it wasn't for Augustine writing what he wrote about the Jewish people, he, he basically wrote that Jewish people are to left, you know, they, they are to survive, they have to survive as a sign for the truth of the Lord, right? Yeah. As witnesses to the truth of the Lord and uh, to the Old Testament. So for that reason, if Augustine did not write what he wrote, I, I think Jewish people would have uh, been extinct a long time ago within the Christian, Christian lands or Christendom, right? So that confusion or that lack of information in the New Testament uh, impacted the Jewish people directly and their experience throughout Christendom was very, very unfortunate, very disturbing and unpleasant. And then comes along Islam and Jewish people found refuge with the Muslims. Hence, the majority of the Jewish population found uh, safe havens within the Muslim lands. That's why they moved in large numbers the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, uh, you know, only uh, continued uh, because of Muslim protection. Otherwise, uh, there would be no Jewish diaspora post six, seven century. I don't think so. Right? In my in my home in uh, London, in Maida Vale, in, in Westminster, I'm not there now, but uh, in Maida Vale, there's a, a Sephardic mo uh, uh, synagogue uh, for explicitly says for Portuguese and Spanish Jews. And it's been there for a very long time. But, but, but the very existence of that small and very influential community in that part of London is a direct tribute to the way that they were welcomed and given uh, space to exist and flourish in the, uh, the Islamic world, which they didn't have in England. Now, obviously, uh, I forget which king it was, but he, was it King John II or something, he expelled the Jews from England. Uh, Edward the first. That was Edward the first. Edward the first, beg your pardon. Um, and it was only many centuries later under Cromwell for, anyway, that's a different story, but, but so it, 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 it impacts even made a veil in London, uh, this, this mm. historical uh, reality you speak of. Um, it, yeah. might be, it might be an idea to draw, to, I mean, I could carry on for hours, but um, we don't want to tire everyone and Adnan out, but um, um, perhaps good idea to draw it to a close. And maybe Adnan, if you, uh, in the future, you were to come back and discuss this further, you'd be most welcome. But um, can I just thank you, Adnan, for your gracious, time uh, answering these questions and really explaining in a very clear way, which is what I wanted to hear, the, the real history uh, of Islam, uh, as opposed to the, the false history, which even my uh, friend across the road here in France is still learning, it seems, in French schools, at least in this part of France, about you know Islam uh, uh, going out with the sword and forcing people to convert. I mean, good, goodness knows what's going on here in France. Um, so, um, is there anything that you want to say in, in conclusion, Adnan, before we close? I, I would like to thank you for inviting me to address these important questions, very, very important questions. I don't think we have addressed these questions in such detail before. Of course, there are far many, far, far more details you can find in books we have mentioned, and there are many, many more books. Perhaps we can put up a list later on at another stage, um, inshallah, and uh, provide reading lists for our yeah. listeners and viewers Excellent. so that they can read more on these topics. Uh, so other than that, thank you so much for your time, for your, for your invitation. Uh, I am honored to be on your blog and uh, I look forward to another one of these. Thank you. Well, that's great. And as I say, that's a great idea Adnan, at the end then about a reading list actually, because I know a lot of uh, viewers, myself included, are, are interested in pursuing this and going beyond the superficialities of social media into some actual uh, scholarly uh, research, which we, we can all do these days. We have an access to these books. So that's great. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much, Adnan Rashid. And until next time, thank you. Thank you.